The end of World War II in 1945 had brought the world peace. As the great cities of Europe and the Far East rebuilt, however, there was an undercurrent of tension between great nations that had allied to defeat fascism. In particular, there was tension between America and the Soviet Union, the world's two emerging superpowers. Stalin had played World War II as one great end game. He sought to fight the war in a way that would enhance his position after the war. Remember, he had made peace with the Nazis at the war's outset so that Russia might prosper as the rest of Europe burned. He stayed out of the war until Hitler blitzed the Soviet Union. As the war went on, Stalin knew that the Soviets weren't going to give back a single inch of ground they took in the war. He delayed advance in Poland so that the Nazis could suppress the uprising of democratic resistance in Warsaw, leaving a clear field for Stalin's puppet regime. The structure of the post-war peace left the United States, England, France, and the Soviet Union in control of parts of Berlin, all surrounded by East Germany, which was controlled by a communist regime. It's not surprising that the first dramatic act of what came to be called the Cold War was played out in the political hotbed, Berlin. Two and a half million people, more than half of Berlin's population, lived in the American, British, and French zones. Supplying those people was an infrastructure of railways, roads, and canals. In 1948, the military government of East Germany clamped a land blockade on Berlin. The city was cut off. No food, no medicine, no anything was allowed through on the ground. The Soviets initially claimed that technical difficulties had caused the stoppage. But as the trucks and trains backed up at the frontiers, it got harder and harder for the communists to claim that some paperwork snafu was behind the change in policy. Clearly, the Soviets had put Berlin under siege and weren't going to let up until the other allies pulled out, ceding the entire city to the communists. There were thousands of occupation personnel, both military and civilian, living in Berlin at the time. We came in as the only government Germany had after the war and stayed on to administer the Marshall Plan and make damn sure the Germany that rose up out of the ashes wasn't a repeat of the Nazi monster that rose up out of World War I. The two and a half million Germans we shared the streets with had watched the communist dictatorship replace the Nazi one in the East, and they wanted no part of that. Threatening to starve us all to death didn't sit very well with any of us. But then, what were we going to do? The roads were cut, and we were rapidly running out of food and fuel. Electricity was rationed, and with that, virtually every aspect of normal life in Berlin came to a halt. The easiest thing would have been to surrender. It wasn't an American city after all, but, but President Truman made a decision. We were going to hold Berlin. Come hell, high water, or Joe Stalin himself, Berlin would not fall. In late June 1948, Commanding General of the U.S. Air Forces in Europe, Curtis LeMay, ordered the beginning of the Berlin Airlift. On June 28, C-47s flying over what had once again become enemy territory brought in 300 tons of supplies. Americans, of course, had a pretty good understanding of the scale of the airlift necessary. After all, they'd flown a couple of million tons of supplies over the Himalayas into China during the war, supplying the entire Chinese army until the completion of the Stillwell Road. But this was still the first real test of the newly independent Air Force. 
The Combined Airlift Task Force established its headquarters in Wiesbaden. In command was General William Tunner, who had overseen the aerial resupply of China during the war. There were very real questions whether an effort of the scope necessary to keep Berlin from starving could be sustained. You have to remember that we weren't just trying to sustain Berlin as a basket case. We were trying to sustain it as a viable, vibrant city. We were trying to sustain normal life. We wanted people to eat, sleep, work, and play normally because we had no idea whether the communist blockade was permanent or not. The Air Force flew in not only food and fuel, but also raw materials so that manufacturing could continue. When the manufacturing was complete, the Air Force loaded and hauled out the finished goods for sale. This was not a temporary military operation. This was really the first time that an airlift had been used as an instrument of U.S. foreign policy. When the commitment was made to sustain Berlin, it was made with the full knowledge that the arrangement might well be permanent, that the planes might well have to make that trip three or four or five times a day forever. No one could know how that was going to turn out. We called it Operation Vittles, the aerial resupply of Berlin. It was bigger than anything any of us had ever been involved in. Even the D-Day vets were impressed. Army, Navy, Air Force, English, French, American. We were all involved. We flew the air corridors in all weather to Tempelhof Field in Berlin. The Army Transportation Corps brought the material in from the ports and railheads in 10-ton trailers. Each one of those was about the capacity of one C-54. The base staging areas were really something to see. Tarmac stacked with pallets. Hangars filled to bursting like, like some kind of huge grocery store. You could take a trip around the world just reading the stencils on the cartons. Sugar from Cuba, coffee from Brazil, butter and milk from Denmark. The merchant marines brought flour and grain from our own Midwest. West Germany did what it could, sending in coal from the Ruhr. Berlin's minimal daily requirement totaled about 4,500 tons a day. By early 1949, we were hauling in over 7,500. The Air Force assigned more than 300 aircraft full-time to the operation. More than 20,000 men worked for months without break to keep the Skybridge going. The British made an enormous contribution, sending men and aircraft of their own to resupply the sector for which they were responsible. Some of the same pilots flying food into the Germans had bombed Berlin. Now our pilots and crews were working overtime to save it. No one stopped to wonder why. It was what needed to be done. The crews even started smuggling in candy for Berlin's kids. <laughs> we made little parachutes and tossed them out of the windows over the city as we came in for our final approach. I still believe that of all the cargo we hauled into Berlin, nothing had as lasting an effect as that candy. The real test came in the fall when the bad weather arrived. Maintaining the airlift through day after day of heavy fog was almost impossible. The communists, who were a little surprised that the effort had made it through the summer, were certain that the fog and rain of the fall would put an end to the airlift. Our seeing eye dog in the weather was the Army Airways communication system. It fed detailed flight information to ground control at Tempelhof. They had operators working radar scopes 24 hours a day talking us down. And with all those planes flying around blind, we needed all the help we could get. Baker George II, uh, this is the final controller. Uh, remain on receive for the remainder of this transmission. 
Uh, maintain your present elevation and continue vector 315. You're almost at the glide path. Uh, begin your rate of descent at 500 feet per minute. We're starting the glide path. A uh, rate of descent is good. Azimuth is good. Elevation good. Very nice flying indeed. Maintain your heading on course, on the glide path. Very good. Now over the end of the runway. Azimuth and elevation both perfect. Touchdown in four seconds. Take it over, Baker George Two. It's all yours from here. One of the unsung miracles of the Berlin airlift was the air traffic control. In a time before Doppler radar, before computers, and all of the equipment today's air traffic controllers take for granted, the Air Force's controllers managed five layers of aircraft only 500 feet apart. At the height of the airlift, the control tower at Tempelhof handled more than 400 landings and takeoffs a day, seven days a week in all weather. There was no room for error, and in the 15 months of the airlift, there was not a single mid-air collision, not one. We set records and then broke them as fast as they could be written down. Coal was crucial and we flew thousands of tons of it into the city. We had to if there was going to be any light or power in West Berlin. The crews sacked it up in war surplus duffel bags. <laughs> Not exactly the most efficient way to transport coal, but it worked. Each aircraft in Operation Vittles flew three round trips into Berlin a day. At both ends of the line, crews waited to load and unload. In Berlin, those crews were made up of people who had been displaced by the blockade. Their lives wouldn't return to normal until the blockade ended. So day after day, they threw themselves into the backbreaking work of unloading aircraft. Berlin was saved because the airlift kept the fires burning, the wheels turning, the ovens baking. For 15 months, the airlift supplied all the necessities of life for a city of two and a half million people. By the time Stalin relented and called off the blockade, the airlift had brought in a ton of supplies, literally, for every man, woman, and child in the city. In 15 months, Operation Vittles gave us what must have been 10 years of airlift experience. We improved systems, methods, and our own understanding of what it took to operate on this scale. And when the whole thing was over, we'd saved Berlin. That wasn't exactly the decisive battle of the Cold War, I know. But it put the communists on notice that, even in the absence of a shooting war, we weren't going to be caught unprepared. The Cold War was a strategic conflict, meaning that it was a war of influence over world events by implication. If I have a bigger gun than you do, I can modify your behavior without ever firing a shot. Little tactical conflicts might break out here and there, but in an age of nuclear weapons, of mutually assured destruction, there's a powerful incentive to keep any conflict between superpowers cold. Hot gets simply too hot. So manufacturing and technology become major players, even if the materiel never sees action. In this building at Fort Worth, Texas, the Air Force and Convair collaborated on the B-36, the first truly intercontinental bomber. No aircraft had ever been built on this scale, with a wingspan of more than 230 feet and a fuselage with the square footage of a six-bedroom house. The B-36 was first conceived during World War II and had her first test flight in 1946. 
The B-36 was something of a bridge between eras. It had both propeller engines and jet engines. Its range, 10,000 miles, was impressive for the time, and its main function was to carry nuclear bombs to a distant enemy. But, like the heavy bombers before it, it also had eight gun turrets, and each of those turrets was a 20-millimeter cannon. It was, conceptually, an enormous continuation of the bombers that had come before, at a time when strategic warfare was about to make a quantum leap forward in both theory and execution. The pure jet bombers were on the drawing boards, as were air-to-air -air and air-to-ground rockets, Intercontinental ballistic missiles were not far off, and submarine-launched missiles were right behind. Those 20-millimeter cannons on a plane that size were kind of, well, quaint. The B-36 was a complicated aircraft, almost too complicated. It took a crew of 16 specialists just to get her off the ground. Some of us old-timers had to go back for special training, but it was an honor to be picked as a member of a B-36 crew. After Berlin, we all knew that the Cold War was real, and the B-36 was, was like being on the front lines. <laughs> Talk about power! Six 3,800-horsepower piston engines helped out by four jets. It took a lot to get the thing rolling, of course, because the plane was big, and its payload seemed even bigger. The bomb bay was designed to carry two 21-ton atomic bombs. <laughs> Lugging that payload, <laughs> you're not exactly driving a sports car. <laughs> but still, there was something exciting about feeling all that power kicking in at the end of the runway. With a fuel load of 21,000 gallons, the B-36 had an effective combat radius of more than 4,000 miles. Flying at more than 40,000 feet, at speeds of up to 435 miles an hour, the B-36 provided the most stable bombing platform in history. In the air, it was a pleasure, especially for the bombardiers. It didn't take long for the B-36 to become the Air Force's Sunday punch and America's most convincing method of winning friends and influencing people. <laughs> it gave the newly created Strategic Air Command the ability to penetrate deep into enemy territory from stateside bases. That meant that anyone who attacked the United States would pay a terrible price, not in years, as was the case in World War II, but in hours. <laughs> to us, at the time, with memories of Pearl Harbor still fresh, that seemed about the best guarantee of peace this country had ever had. After the end of World War II, the essential conflict in the world was between communism and capitalism. In China, the key players, Mao Zedong's communist forces and Chiang Kai-shek's nationalist troops, had spent most of the war jockeying for post-war position. The communists ultimately won, taking the mass of China, leaving the nationalists isolated on the tiny island of Taiwan. The openly stated goal of communism was world domination. While the Soviets enjoyed control over much of Europe, the Chinese communists looked to expand their holdings in Asia, June 1950, on the Korean Peninsula, in the shadow of Manchuria, communist forces attack. It is to be the first open warfare in what was then coming to be known as the Cold War. In the summer of 1950, recruits started to pour into bases around the country. President Truman had declared that the communists wouldn't be allowed to take South Korea. Things weren't going well for our side. The Reds looked like they just might push us right off the peninsula. We were hunkered down on a teeny patch of land around Pusan, a port city about as far south as you can go in Korea without getting seasick. There didn't seem to be a way for the guys on the ground to buy enough time to dig a toehold. The only real asset we had was our air strength, and we were outnumbered even there. The 
the Air Force bought time to reinforce the troops on the ground. It was clear from the outset that air power had to be maintained and increased quickly. Naturally, that meant training pilots, but it also meant training the ground and support crews necessary to keep the aircraft in the air, with a war suddenly raging overseas. There's an old saying in the military, amateurs plan strategy, professionals worry about logistics. Korea gave us a lot to worry about fast. Supplies had to be airlifted in stages over the Pacific Ocean, something that just wouldn't have been possible 10 years earlier. Techniques developed in the Berlin airlift a few years before helped, and it was great to see the veterans of that operation passing that knowledge onto the new kids just coming in. At a time in history when there were maybe 10 commercial flights a week across the Pacific, the Military Air Transport Service ran 30 Trans-Pacific round trips a day, 206 aircraft working constantly, bridging the Pacific from North America to Japan. Three months after the war's outbreak in September 1950, the Pacific airlift was flying 250,000 miles a day, Sundays too. The Combat Cargo Command took the supplies and soldiers from Japan into the Korean battle zone. While the American and South Korean troops were being driven back to the Pusan perimeter, overall Allied strength in Korea was on the rise. August 1950, a C-47 from Japan arrived at the Taegu airfield inside the Pusan perimeter. We were preparing a big push north, and there was to be a conference of top-level commanders representing all three of the armed services. We knew that they were meeting. We didn't know what they had planned. It was MacArthur's plan, a variation on the island hopping he'd used so successfully in World War II. Land the reinforcements behind the enemy's lines, opening a second front and bypassing the enemy's strength. The B-29 started softening up in John a few days before the landing. We had 140 of them. Their mission was twofold to neutralize the enemy ground forces and to attack all Korean airfields in enemy hands. The week before Incheon, we flew more than 3,000 sorties over Incheon. We bombed rail lines, tunnels, marshalling yards, anything useful to the enemy. We were practically unopposed in the air, for we had long since effectively disposed of the red air strength, which was not going to be troublesome until the MiGs appeared later in the year. The final naval bombardment began on the morning of 15 September 1950 at Incheon, on Korea's west coast. General MacArthur witnessed the landing of the 1st Marine Division and the 7th U.S. Infantry Division. The landing craft had to reckon with a 29-foot tide. The Air Force had done its part by hammering the enemy's ground forces, supply lines, and airfields. On the day following the landing at Incheon, the UN forces, hemmed in for a month at the perimeter around Busan, broke through. Up to now, the Reds had done all the advancing, and now it was our turn. MacArthur called it the end of the war offensive. He intended to drive the Korean communists into the Yalu River 
at the Chinese border, the same way the Koreans had planned to drive us into the Sea of Japan. Our ground forces were formidable. We had four U.S. infantry divisions, seven South Korean divisions, and one British brigade. Our air effort paved the way for the rapid advance up the peninsula. We'd completely knocked out enemy aircraft and airfields. Our troops had nothing to fear from red air action. There wasn't much effective opposition of any kind as our forces went on to retake the South Korean capital city of Seoul. There was soon to be a large-scale rendezvous of our ground forces that landed at Incheon with those that had come up from the Pusan perimeter. Next, the advance to the Yalu River. After the Incheon landing, the Combat Cargo Command pulled off one of the best-managed airdrops in history. C-47s and C-119s begin airdrops in enemy territory about 30 miles north of the captured North Korean capital, Pyongyang. They drop not only men and the usual supplies, food, ammunition, things like that, but also jeeps, howitzers, even trucks. The objective was to trap as many of the retreating enemy as possible and to strengthen the UN's continued advance to the Yalu. On the 1st of November, 1950, enemy air power suddenly re-entered the war in a dangerous way. In the steel gray skies over North Korea, the first Russian-built MiG-15s appeared. The F-86 was under development, but wasn't battle ready. So our best jet at the time was the F-80. It was a good aircraft, but on paper, no match for the MiG-15s. They were like lightning. Still, we did all right. Our training left our pilots second to none, and it was in an F-80 that Lieutenant Russell Brown shot down the first MiG, the first of many. Cameras mounted on the wings of our fighters automatically photographed the air battle. Only a little more than a month after the breakthrough at the perimeter and the Incheon landing, virtually all of Korea was in UN hands. MacArthur's end of war offensive had gone splendidly. By late November 1950, elements of the 17th U.S. Infantry reached a point on the Yalu River. More than 100,000 North Korean prisoners had been taken. A lot of the prisoners had frozen feet. It can be mighty cold in the upper reaches of North Korea in late November. Some of the UN forces got to the Yalu, but that was as far as they were permitted to go. Policy at the highest level forbade any advance or airstrike beyond the river. There were some who wanted to follow the North Koreans right up into China, if that's what it took to finish him off. President Truman wanted to keep the Chinese out of the war, so he refused to allow even minor incursions into Chinese territory. It was a good idea, it just didn't work. 
A quarter of a million Chinese regulars poured over the Yalu into North Korea. MacArthur looked out over the battlefield and said, Gentlemen, what we have here is an entirely new war. When the Chinese came into the war, the effective enemy strength increased by about 300%. Suddenly we were opposed by great masses of Chinese troops and were greatly outnumbered. A rapid retreat to the south had to be made. MacArthur didn't like it, but he had no choice. The front was headed south to Seoul, and it made no sense to be on the wrong side of it. As the ground forces pulled back, the only effective way of both slowing the Chinese advance and supplying the troops on the ground was the Air Force. The C-119s, operating from a Shia air base in southern Japan, dropped supplies to the withdrawing ground forces. The operation was fast, chaotic, and easily the most important thing most of us had ever done. The last week of November, 1950, we got the first F-80s up into the air. Those were hot planes for their time. The F-80s would come right in close to the lines and hit the enemy hard. They also ran interdiction and reconnaissance missions far behind enemy lines. Now, if you see MIGs up there today, call them out. Now, remember, once you look around, keep your speed up, and just do get a bounce, cut him off. When you get in range, shoot, and when you shoot, shoot the kill. Anybody got any questions? In the middle of December 1950, the F-86s finally arrived and went into action against the MiGs. MiG Alley the wide band of airspace over Northwest Korea became the setting for the first all-jet air war. F-86s held up well against the MiGs. Even though we were outnumbered four to one, we creamed them. The difference was the pilots. I really believed we had the best in the world. In mid-January 1951, the United Nations ground forces mounted a counterattack from the line of their furthest withdrawals they pounded their way from below the 38th parallel and through the Iron Triangle. By June, the Reds were ready for an armistice. 
The battle line of mid-June was to remain more or less stabilized throughout the coming peace talks. The truce negotiations began in July 1951. A couple of weeks before, the Russian delegate to the United Nations had made it clear that the Reds had had enough. For the next two years, peace talks made faltering progress. During that time, air assaults on the enemy continued. After 21 months of dispute, chiefly over the problem of prisoners, an agreement was reached, at least on the exchange of sick and wounded. In April 1953, Operation Little Switch began. To Pan Munjun, communist ambulances brought at the rate of 100 a day about 600 United Nations prisoners. Now, this operation was followed some months later by Big Switch, the large-scale exchange of the rest of the prisoners. At Panmunjom on 27 July 1953, the Korean conflict ended. Lieutenant General William Harrison, chief negotiator for the United Nations, signs the agreement followed by General Naum Il for the North Koreans. During the war, we downed 827 MiGs. The UN forces only lost 112 jet aircraft. It was one of the most successful air campaigns ever. 39 of our pilots became aces. What followed the war wasn't peace. It was just a ceasefire an armed truce, a microcosm of the Cold War itself. North Korea and South Korea remained formally in a state of war, but without shooting. Lives lost, national wealth squandered, and no clear resolution. Looking back to the end of the war in 45, we flyers have a bit of a tendency to think about the planes. It was the planes, after all, that got us in to do the job, and then got us back out, alive. During bull sessions, we used to talk about how great it would be if, if we could have bombs that would drop themselves. Bullets that would chase the other guy down and kill him. What we didn't realize is that back in the States, that's exactly what the scientists and engineers were working on. There were things just beginning, Research being done, discoveries being made, that were so secret, no one up on the front lines ever even heard a hint of them. They had things on the drawing boards that damn near made aircraft irrelevant. And that's a hell of a thing for an old flyer to have to say. Missiles are now so common and vital to air war that it's hard to believe that such a tremendous and revolutionary development is so recent. The development and deployment has taken place largely since World War II, but the conception goes back much further than that. Like most of the technical and tactical innovations in American air power, the origin of missile warfare, both theater and intercontinental, are traceable back to the same relatively small groups of visionaries. The first smart bomb was developed under the supervision of Orville Wright. The young Air Force officer he worked with was Hap Arnold, who later, as the chief of the Army Air Forces, played a large part in building the Air Force that would decimate the Luftwaffe during World War II. As the weapons developers searched for a new form of propulsion, they turned to rocket geniuses Robert Goddard and Werner von Braun. These are names that keep turning up all through the history of the Air Force and that bridged the passage from biplanes to the nuclear age. One of the earliest experiments in missile development was called the Bug. It was primitive, a small pilotless airplane designed to deliver a TNT warhead. Scientists hoped that the bug would allow air crews to hit targets with greater accuracy while enjoying less high-risk time over the target. Alas, the bug was a failure as a weapon. Its propulsion system was feeble, and its remote control capabilities virtually non-existent. But it was a start. 
The problem of propulsion was, at the time, being solved by a small group of scientists headed by Robert Goddard. In 1926, working in Massachusetts, Goddard achieved the first firing of a liquid fuel rocket. It reached the grand altitude of 184 feet. During the 1930s, Goddard was in New Mexico, working largely in obscurity without government support. In his research and experiments, he did not have military missiles in mind. His objective and his achievement was a propulsion system that could send scientific payloads to high altitudes. At the end of the war, there was some battlefield use of three basic kinds of guided missiles. We experimented a little with guided gliders dropped from conventional aircraft and controlled by radio. They worked great in tests, but were pretty useless in battle. On a larger scale, the boys at the War Department suggested we make use of weary willies, obsolete aircraft loaded with TNT and flown by remote control toward a target. About all that accomplished was blowing up some planes that would have been bulldozed after the war anyway. We also had some air-to-ground missiles, 2.75 inches, that we used for strafing. And the only advantage they had over conventional weapons was you didn't have to calculate for the pull of gravity because they went in a straight line. Ironically, the Germans and Japanese both had guided missile programs that were more successful than anything the Allies had. The Germans, of course, had the V-1 and V-2 programs. They were technologically snazzy and militarily ineffective. In 1936, the Germans began developing what Hitler called vengeance weapons. In 1944, they had their first real success, the V-1 buzz bomb. Typically, Hitler chose to use his vengeance weapon on the civilian population of London, rather than on Allied troops or supply concentrations. They eventually fired more than 7,000 V1s, and more than 2,000 of them landed on London. We shot down more than 4,000 V1s. They were really nothing but pilotless jets, aimed in the general direction of cities and let fly. Every night for months, we went up and knocked him down. In September of that same year, 1944, the Germans also began their firings of the vastly superior V-2, which was powered by a real liquid fuel engine. It had a speed of 3,300 miles per hour, and it could not be intercepted by fighter aircraft or brought down by anti-aircraft artillery. More than 1,100 fell on England. They not only took a toll of more than 9,000 casualties, they also had a devastating psychological effect. For unlike the buzz bomb, the V-2 fell silently, without warning. As the forerunner of the long-range ballistic missiles, the V-2 blasted open a new era. But the Germans have always admitted that they could not have brought off this achievement without the research and example of the American, Goddard. If, in 1945, you wanted a glimpse of what battle was going to be like in the age of missiles, all you needed to do was look at the effect of the kamikaze in the Pacific Theater. People don't think of kamikazes as guided missiles, but that's what they were. And the effect the kamikaze had with their ability to take evasive action while homing in on a target was devastating. After the introduction of guided missiles, battle would never be the same.
At the end of World War II, the American military transported captured German V-2 missiles and their components back to the United States for study. The entire German missile program ended up at White Sands Missile Range. Included in the transfer of German assets to the United States were a handful of German rocket scientists, including Werner von Braun. At the time, the authorities called von Braun and his group prisoners of peace, because we probably didn't have any real legal grounds for holding them. Mostly what we had were resources, and the Germans, who were first and foremost concerned with continuing their research, didn't complain as long as they could keep building their rockets. While von Braun and the Germans worked on big rockets, other groups around the country worked on smaller tactical rocket weapons. The earliest success of guided anti-aircraft missiles showed just exactly how devastating missiles would become. Now this was a type of rocket that would get a flyer's attention. If you listen to the brass, future battles on the ground would be irrelevant next to the battle in the air. Can you imagine what the early aces could have done with an anti-aircraft missile that could outrun and follow any evasive maneuver? It didn't take long to see that the aerial battlefield was going to be one hot place. The first missiles to go into service was the Falcon, a fast, accurate, and powerful guided missile launched from interceptors. This was indeed a very different type of warfare. Back in the desert, the German and American scientists succeeded in developing a generation of tactical battlefield missiles. The Matador was the Air Force's first successful ground-to-ground -ground guided missile. It was boosted off by a rocket, and then a turbojet engine took over, kind of like the German buzz bomb. The missiles were electronically controlled by ground personnel, and they blew up a lot of taxpayer money before they started getting them up on a regular basis. The Mace was an improved version of the Matador. It was larger, faster, and had a greater range. To increase that range even more, they developed SNARK, the world's first intercontinental missile. It had a range of about 5,000 miles. missile was the Air Force Bomark, a guided missile launched from the ground and capable of destroying approaching hostile bombers hundreds of miles away at very high altitudes. After launching by rocket, it's powered at supersonic speed by twin ramjet engines. The same research would lead eventually to both manned spaceflight and intercontinental ballistic missiles, but in the Cold War atmosphere, it was only natural that the scientists would first concentrate on marrying the newest explosive with the newest delivery device. The Air Force put together all kinds of nuclear missile combinations, including an unguided nuclear air-to-air -air missile called Genie that could blow whole fleets of flying aircraft out of the sky. Through the 1950s, the concept of the mixed force evolved. Along with the missiles, new generations of manned aircraft were being developed. The B-47 was a highly dependable modern medium bomber capable of carrying nuclear weapons. And the B-52 Stratofortress is in its fourth decade of service. The Thor, the Air Force's first intermediate range missile, began a series of successful launchings in 1957. Again, the dichotomy of missile development. It was designed to carry a nuclear warhead, but it reached its greatest success as a booster for satellites and space probes.
The research continued. The X-10, driven by turbojet engines, provided much needed information about aerodynamics. The X-17, a three-stage test missile, saved a lot of time and money in solving problems of re-entry at high speed and consequent high temperatures. In 1955, the President ordered the development of the Atlas, and within two years, the Air Force achieved the first successful launch. Other formidable missiles, such as Titan and Minuteman, were in the research and testing stage. In the short span of 40 years, we'd gone from flying cloth and wood slivers to developing missiles that could strike precisely from thousands of miles away. Experimentation in space travel increased the Air Force's knowledge of what is now called human factors engineering. With planes getting faster, the G-forces that must be endured in battle increased enormously. It was in studying for the rapid acceleration and deceleration of space travel that the greatest advances were made. You have to remember, at the time, we didn't know things that have since become basic. For example, there was a tremendous preoccupation in some circles with the kind of radiation pilots and eventually astronauts would be subject to at high altitudes. There was a fear that what were then called cosmic rays might just fry or mutate anyone who ventured out of the atmosphere. Air Force Major David Simons bravely rode a balloon up to 102,000 feet in a cabin left largely open so that he would absorb whatever kind of mystery rays that were up there. When he came back down, we were relieved to see he still had one head, ten fingers, and his eyesight intact. At Holloman Air Force Base, scientists concerned with the ability of the human body to absorb the sudden stops and starts of spaceflight tested the outer limits of human endurance. They put men and animals on rocket sleds, and during each run, instruments recorded rates of acceleration and deceleration, peak g-forces. It was not unusual to sustain G-loads from 25 to 45. In 1958, Captain Eli L. Beating, an Air Force program scientist, survived 82.6 Gs for four one-hundredths of a second. It beat him up pretty bad. It was like getting hit in the chest by a truck, but he survived. The animals used in the testing out at Holloman were trained to perform an awful lot of the same functions pilots were trained to perform. Of course, this was not lost on the pilots. There was just something about seeing a monkey manipulating a control panel. The scientists liked that too much, if you ask me. Monkeys in the cockpit. <laughs> we never heard the end of it. But we went along because flyers in the age of rockets had to be equipped to maneuvers and forces and challenges human beings had never endured before. In the decade and a half since the end of World War II, the whole business of war had changed in no small part because of rockets. Munitions were suddenly more precise, they worked at longer range. Their delivery put none of our troops at risk. This was the high-tech solution to the low-tech problem of war. 
The ironic thing about those ICBMs is they're the only system ever deployed by the Air Force that was never really tested. <laughs> oh, the components were tried and retried and tried some more, but all the pieces were never put together and tried. No one ever launched an ICBM with a nuclear tip to a target and got it to explode. I think about that now. The weapons we'd built, the weapons that were making the world safe for freedom, were so terrible they couldn't even be tested. The country, in the throes of the Cold War, was looking for something that would restore the unquestioned primacy we had at the end of the war. In missiles, nuclear weapons, and jet aircraft, we really thought we'd reach that ideal which traced its roots back to the beginnings of time peace through strength. We really felt we were ready for anything the world could throw at us. 